Coca-Cola Company murders union organizers. See killercoke.org. So I won't use Coca-Cola Company products, not even if somebody else paid for them. That's not the point. So uh, could someone possibly get me some water I can drink that is not from Coca-Cola Company? But you yeah, can wait a few minutes. Should I start? Oh, no, you are still setting up. So is there a store on campus that sells this water? Is that, well, if I were here, I would never get water from that store. <laughs> you know, they set it up so that the easiest thing to do is what helps them. So if you do what's easiest, you're doing what they want. So you've got to be ready to do something that's not quite so convenient, that's a little bit of extra trouble, and thwarts them. So I make an effort to avoid Coca-Cola Company products. In fact, once I since I decided to join the boycott, I think I have never used a Coca-Cola Company product. Okay, so that camera doesn't seem to be pointed at me. Oh, I see, that's just recording. Okay. So first two requests. If you take photos of me, please do not put them in Facebook. <laughs> Facebook is a monstrous surveillance engine. If you put a photo of someone in Facebook, you give Facebook one more opportunity to do surveillance on that person, which is a bad way to treat someone. So we could dispute whether you ought to put photos of your friends in Facebook, but that doesn't directly affect me. What does affect me is whether you put photos of me in Facebook. Please don't. And really, you shouldn't use Facebook at all. I wouldn't, it wouldn't matter how many people pushed me to use Facebook, I would still say no. <clears throat> the other thing is, if you make a recording of this speech and you want to distribute copies, please only in the formats that are favorable to free software. That is the OGG formats and WebM not in MP anything, not in Flash, which is why you shouldn't put them on YouTube, and not in Real Player, Windows Media Player, or QuickTime. It's bad to make files in those formats. And also, on the recording copies you distribute, please put the Creative Commons No Derivatives license because this is a presentation of my personal views. So, what is free software? Free software means software that respects your freedom and your community. So, it's free as in freedom. It's livre, not gratis. <clears throat> so, to understand the term free software, think of free speech, not free beer. When a program is not free, we call it non-free, proprietary, and user-subjugating software. <laughs> In Portuguese, it's privativo because it, not, it deprives people of their freedom. 
<clears throat> a non-free program generates a system of unjust power, power for the owner of the program over its users. It's a kind of digital colonization. And like any colonial system, it keeps the users divided and helpless. Divided because they're forbidden to redistribute it and helpless because they don't have the source code so they can't change it. They can't even study independently what it really does to them. And quite frequently it does something nasty and I'll tell you more details in a few minutes. So for the newcomers, I'd like to mention my two requests. First, don't put photos of me in Facebook. And second, if you distribute copies of, if you make a recording and distribute copies, please only in the AUG formats or WebM and with the Creative Commons no derivatives license. So, <clears throat> this is why free software is the just way to distribute software and proprietary software is an injustice. But that's what I've said is very general. It respects your freedom and community. I had better be more specific. A program is free software if it gives you the four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and change it so it does your computing as you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to help others. That's the freedom to redistribute exact copies to others when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to contribute to your community, which is the freedom to make copies of your modified versions and distribute them to others when you wish. So if the program gives you these four freedoms adequately, then it's free software because the social system of its distribution and use is an ethical system, one that respects freedom and community. But if one of these freedoms is missing or insufficient, then the program is proprietary because it imposes an unethical social system on its users. Now, in order for these freedoms to be adequate, they must apply to all activities of life. But none of these freedoms is a requirement. They're not mandatory. So with freedom zero, you're free to run the program as you wish, but it's not required. If you're a masochist, you can run it as you don't wish. <laughs> and you also have the option not to run it. With freedom one, you're free to study and change the source code, but it's not required. You also have the option to receive a copy and run it and not look at anything. With freedom two, you're free to make exact copies and distribute them to others, but it's never required. You do it when you decide to do it. We never tell you, you must cooperate with her. No, the point is you must be free to cooperate with her if you choose. And with freedom three, if you have made a modified version, you are free to distribute copies of that, but it's not required. You can go on using your version privately. Then it's private software. Private because you're the only user. And it's free software because you have the four freedoms. It's free software in a sort of trivial way, but it is free. <clears throat> so, as you can see, the distinction between free software and proprietary software is not a technical distinction. It's not about what features the program has, not directly. It's not about how they are implemented. It's not about how the code was written. Those are technical details. This distinction is an ethical, social, and political distinction, which makes it more important than any merely technical distinction. The use of free software in society is development. 
Every program embodies knowledge. When it's free, that knowledge is available for the users to understand. Then they can maintain, adapt, and extend the program. They can also use their knowledge in other ways. However, the use of proprietary software in society is not, there are plenty of seats on the other side. It, the use of proprietary software is not development because that's dependence, imposed dependence on one particular entity. That's a social problem. If we see people using proprietary software, we should try to, to rescue them. We should try to put an end to the use of proprietary software. The goal should be proprietary software zero. <laughs> to write a free program is a contribution to society because <clears throat> it enables people to do more and have freedom. Of course, how much of a contribution, that depends on the details. If the program does something very useful, that contributes a lot. If it does very little and does it badly, that contributes very little. But if the program is free, at least it's distributed in a way that enables it to contribute however much it has to offer. However, Writing a proprietary program is no contribution because it's a power grab. It's an attempt to subjugate people. In social terms, this proprietary program is a trap. If it has attractive features, those are the bait. Their purpose is to attract people to fall into the trap, losing their freedom. So paradoxically, they don't make the program better. They make it more harmful. So if you could open one. <laughs> oh, oh, that has gas in it. Oh, I can't drink it with gas. <laughs> Basically, I only like soda if it has sugar in it. I'm sorry, I should have said without gas. But I don't always remember this problem. I hope someone else will like it. But anyway, I guess if we could pour it into a bowl in an hour, I might be able to drink it. Um, So if you have the choice to write a proprietary program or do nothing, it's better to do nothing because that way you don't do harm. Writing a proprietary program is doing harm to society. You shouldn't do it. Now, in real life, you would probably have more than two choices. You could do something else. Maybe that would be better than both of these two. But if we are really just thinking about these two, don't write a proprietary program. Don't help develop a proprietary program. Thus, the goal of the free software movement is to make all software free so that all the users of software can be free. But what makes these four freedoms essential? Why define free software this way? Each freedom has a reason. Freedom to, the freedom to help others, the freedom to make and distribute exact copies when you wish is essential on fundamental moral grounds. So you can live an upright ethical life as a good member of your community. If you use a program without freedom to, you are in danger of falling into a moral dilemma at any moment, whenever your good friend says, I like that program, could I have a copy? In that moment, you will face a choice between two evils. One evil is to give your good friend a copy and violate the license of the program. The other evil is to refuse your good friend a copy and comply with the license of the program. 
if you are in the dilemma, you ought to choose the lesser evil, which is to give your good friend a copy and violate the license of the program. <laughs> Why is this the lesser evil? Because if you can't avoid doing wrong to one or another, it's less bad to do the wrong to somebody who deserves it because he has acted wrong. <laughs> now we can assume that your good friend is a good member of your community and normally deserves your cooperation because that's usually so. But the developer of this proprietary program has deliberately attacked the social solidarity of your community, which is very bad. So, if you have to do wrong to your good friend or the developer, do it to the developer. However, being the lesser evil does not make it good. It's never good to make an agreement and break it. Not even an evil agreement like this one. When the agreement is evil, keeping it is worse than breaking it. But still, breaking it is not good. And if you give your good friend a copy, what will she have? She will have an unauthorized copy of a proprietary program, and that's a rather nasty thing. It's almost as nasty as an authorized copy of the same program. It's nasty because it's proprietary. So, when you have fully understood this dilemma, what should you really do? You should make sure you don't fall into the dilemma. I know two ways. One is, don't have any friends. <laughs> That's, uh oh, this looks like it's more, ah, good, it's a different, it's not Coca-Cola, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Could you open one? So one method is don't have any friends. That's the method that the proprietary developers have in mind for your future. Instead of friends, you can have Facebook friends. The other method, my method, is reject that program. If someone offers me a program, no matter how convenient and useful it might seem to be, on the condition that I not share it with you, I reject it. I tell him, my conscience doesn't allow me to accept the terms you have set, so take your nasty program away. That's what you should tell him also. Reject the software that denies freedom too, and also reject the propaganda terms that they use to demonize cooperation and sharing. Terms like pirate, when they call the people who share pirates, what are they really saying? They're saying that helping your neighbor is the moral equivalent of attacking ships. In moral terms, this is as wrong as you can get because attacking ships is very bad, but sharing is good. So let's not call them both by the same name. That's where the lie comes in. So when someone asks me what I think of piracy, I respond, attacking ships is very bad. <laughs> and if they ask what I think of movie piracy, I say, I liked the first Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> so you get the point, repeating the enemy's propaganda terms is spreading the enemy's propaganda ideas. It's supporting the enemy, so don't do it. Well, that's the reason for freedom too, the freedom to redistribute exact copies, essential on basic moral grounds. 
But freedom zero, the freedom to run the program as you wish, is essential for a different reason. So you can have control of your own computing. And every user of computing deserves to have control of his own computing. But there are proprietary programs that restrict through their licenses even the use of the authorized copies. For instance, there is a proprietary program for managing websites whose license forbids using it to publish anything that criticizes the program's developer. In this case, proprietary software actually takes away freedom of speech. So clearly, if you can't even freely run the copy that's supposed to be for you to run, you don't have control of your computing. Freedom zero is essential. But it's not enough, because that means you can either do or not do whatever the code of the program is already set up to do. Which means the developer still controls what you, how you do your computing, not through the license if you have freedom zero, but rather through the code itself. So in order to have control of your computing, you need freedom one, the freedom to study the source code and change it, to make the program do your computing the way you wish. That way you decide instead of him. Now, there are computers nowadays that let, the, let, let some company install changed software, but they won't let the user install changed software. We call those tyrant devices. And those executables are not free. Because f to have freedom one in practice means that you can actually run your version of the program. If the computer will only run so-and-so's versions and won't run yours, that is a form of digital handcuffs and it means you don't have freedom one. Those executable programs are not free. If you don't have freedom one, you can't even tell what the program is really doing. And it's quite common for proprietary programs without freedom one to have malicious features that do things such as spy on the user, restrict the user, and there are even back doors that can attack the user. Life, there are many, in, in, in life, there are many rare dangers. Lots of bad things that happen to some people occasionally, but they probably won't happen to you today. This is not one of them. Being the victim of malicious functionalities is the usual case for users of proprietary software. Almost all of them are suffering from this harm. <clears throat> Almost every user of proprietary software is using proprietary malware. Malware means software designed to hurt the user. And these programs are malware. To prove that this is the usual case, I'll give you a list of examples. One proprietary package in which people have discovered all three kinds of malicious functionalities, which you may have heard of, is called Microsoft Windows. People have found surveillance features that send data about the use of the machine to a server. The digital handcuffs, the features to the malicious functionalities to restrict what users can do with the data they've got can be seen. If the machine just refuses to, give, to show you any way to do something, that you can see. The back doors can't be seen easily. But I, I can't understand what? Well, yeah, I'm getting to that. Um, basically, <clears throat> we know of two backdoors in Windows. So Windows is malware, but it's even worse than that. 
because one of these backdoors is a universal backdoor. It allows Microsoft to forcibly install software changes. In effect, it's an auto-update that can't be turned off. You, there are two ways to look at the same thing. And that means that any malicious functionality that is not in Windows today could be forcibly installed tomorrow. So Windows is universal malware. But Windows is not alone. Mac OS is malware because it has digital handcuffs. The feature malicious functionalities to restrict the user. Now these are also known as DRM for Digital Restrictions Management. But the newer Apple products, the iThings, are much worse. People have found several surveillance features in them. They have the tightest digital handcuffs ever in a general purpose computer. Apple pioneered designing general purpose computers so that they take control even of the installation of applications. Users of the iThings are not free to install whatever application they wish. They can only install applications that Apple put in the App Store, which means that Apple practices censorship through these monsters. And when the users find ways to break those particular handcuffs, they call it jailbreaking, which means escaping from prison, which effectively recognizes that these computers are designed as prisons for their users. And there's also a backdoor. So the software in Apple's computer products are ma is malware. Then there's Flash Player. Flash Player has a surveillance feature called Super Cookies and Digital Handcuffs. So, Flash, so it's malware. Flash Player is gratis, but it's not free software. And this shows that being gratis is not very important. In fact, what does it mean that Flash Player is gratis? It means that Adobe does not make users pay to be abused. <laughs> so if you installed Flash Player because it's gratis, delete it immediately. Protect yourself. Then there is Angry Birds. <laughs> Angry Birds is spyware. It collects location information and sends it off. Lots of apps for the iThings and for Android also are spyware or in other ways malware. Then there is the PlayStation 3. Now game consoles had the sort of censorship that we now associate with the iThings but they had it earlier. It was first done in game consoles and then Apple took it to general purpose computers. And the system is a tyrant, so it was designed not to let users replace the low level software. And somebody found a way to jailbreak it and do that. And Sony sent the police after him, which is why we say boycott Sony. And then there is the Amazon Swindle. That's not its official name, but that's what it is. It's an e-reader which is designed so that it swindles readers out of the traditional freedoms of readers. For instance, there's the freedom to acquire a book anonymously, paying cash, which is the only way I will ever buy a book because I don't want my name to be in a database listing what books I've read. But that's what happens with the swindle. It's impossible to pay cash at Amazon. Amazon makes users identify themselves, so Amazon has a giant list of all the books each user has read in that device. 
Such a list is a threat to human rights. We can't tolerate its existence anywhere. Then there's the freedom to give a book to someone else after you've read it or to lend it to various people or to sell it to a used bookstore. Amazon eliminates these freedoms with digital handcuffs in the swindle together with end-user license agreements that show contempt for private property. Amazon says the users can't own these books. All they can do is get a license to read them under Amazon's imposed conditions. Then there's the freedom to keep the book as long as you wish. Amazon abolishes that freedom with a back door. We know about the back door by observation. In 2009, Amazon remotely erased thousands of copies of a particular book. Copies which, until that very day, were authorized copies. The users had obtained them directly from Amazon in the approved manner. And then Amazon one day deleted them all. An Orwellian act. I met somebody once who said that the book had vanished while he was reading it. And you know what the book was? It was 1984 by George Orwell. <laughs> the book that gave us the frightening slogan, Big Brother is Watching You. It presented a totalitarian state whose crimes began with destroying the books it didn't like. There was a lot of criticism of Amazon, and Amazon promised never to do this again unless ordered to by the state, which, if you've read 1984, is not very comforting. The official name of this product is the Kindle. Kindle means to start a fire, which I suppose is meant to suggest that its real purpose is for virtual book burning. But it's never going to burn my books because I'm never going to use that or anything else like it. I'm not going to use anything that takes away even one of these freedoms. <clears throat> And the last example in my list of widely used proprietary malware is nearly all portable phones. They have a surveillance feature and a universal backdoor. The surveillance feature is they will send the GPS location on remote command. The universal backdoor means that some company can remotely install software changes without asking permission. And this has been used to convert telephones into listening devices. You've heard of software that has bugs. Well, this is software that is a bug. And the phone listens all the time. You don't have to talk into the microphone either. It can listen to you from the other side of the room you might try to switch it off and then it will pretend to be off but it will really still be on and still be listening. Because of these malicious functionalities portable phones are Stalin's dream. That's why I don't have one. And by the way they can localize the phone without even without the cooperation of the phone, even if the phone doesn't send GPS locations, every year they get better at figuring out where the phone really is. <clears throat> so the, the non-free malicious programs in my list are used by most of the people who use proprietary software. And that proves that most users of proprietary software are victims of proprietary malware. But these are just a few examples. There are thousands of proprietary programs. What about them? Are they malware? Well, it's hard to tell. 
we can't, we're talking about programs without Freedom 1, so we can't, in general, see their source code. We can't study them to see if they have any malicious functionalities. In effect, the same entity that might have put in malicious functionalities is preventing us from checking. So these are all just trust us software. We're a company. You know a company would never treat people badly. All of them, they, may, they are not necessarily all malware, but they all demand blind faith from the user. Faith which is never justified. <clears throat> but I'm sure there are some of them which have no malicious functionalities. What can we say about those? We can't identify which ones they are, but I'm sure there are some. Well, their developers are human, so they make mistakes. Those programs have bugs, because it's inevitable. So the user of a program without Freedom 1 is just as helpless facing an accidental error as facing an intentional malicious feature. If you use a program without Freedom 1, you're a prisoner of the code. We free software developers are human too. We also make mistakes. Our free programs have bugs too because it's inevitable. Every non-trivial program has bugs. But if you find a bug in our free code or anything in the code you don't like, you are free to change it because we did not make you our prisoner. We can't be perfect. We can respect your freedom. <clears throat> so freedom one is essential, but it's not enough because that's the freedom to personally study and change the source code or to do it within one organization. That's not enough because most users don't know how to program. They don't know how to exercise Freedom 1, at least not directly. But even for someone like me who does know how to program, Freedom 1's not enough because there's so much free software in the world already that no one person could possibly, no one user of computing could possibly study and master all the source code for the program she uses, nor personally write all the changes she might want, because that's more work than one human being can do. So the only way to fully have control of our computing is by working together, collaborating. And for that, we need Freedom 3, which permits us to work together in changing a free program. Freedom 3 is the freedom to contribute to your community, the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions. So if a group of users want to work together to improve a free program, well, everyone in the group can distribute copies of her modified version to the rest of the group. And when they're happy with the result, they can distribute their modified versions to the public also. And that way, all the users can run that modified version if they wish, including the ones who don't know how to program. Without Freedom 3, yes, each of us would be free to personally write the same change. But what a waste it would be to write this change millions of times. And the people who can't program would be excluded completely. That's not good enough. Freedom 3 is essential. <clears throat> now, most users don't know how to exercise Freedom 1 or Freedom 3 because they don't know how to program. But they can get the benefit of these freedoms indirectly by paying someone else to program for them. So if you are using a free program and you don't know how to program, you, you want to change but you don't know how to write it yourself. Well, of course, you could learn, but that's not much consolation. But you, there's something easier you could do. You could pay some programmer to write that change for you. And it can be any programmer who's willing to do the job, because this is a free market. So 
<clears throat> in practice, it's feasible to find someone and pay him to make a change for you. Now, you don't exercise freedom one and three. He exercises them for you in order to give you the modified version you asked for. And a substantial part of free software business works this way. And the four freedoms together give us democracy. A free program develops democratically under the control of its users because every user is free to participate as much as she wishes in society's decision about the future of this program, which is simply the sum total of what all the users decide to do with it. By contrast, yes? Sorry, if it's an unrelated question, then, well, maybe, maybe it's a total misunderstanding. You know, I don't know what case you're talking about. Are you talking about free software? Yeah, yeah. With free software, you're free to change it. You can charge for doing the work of changing it. You can say, I'll do this work for you, but you have to pay me $1,000. You certainly you can, because you're free to change it or not. So you're free to change it if someone pays you. So free software demo develops democratically, as I said, but proprietary software develops under the sole and total power of the developer and operates in social terms as an instrument to impose that developer's power on the users whom the, that the developer can then uh, push around, exploit, and abuse. Because ultimately, with software there are just two possibilities. Either the users control the program or the program controls the users. With free software, the users control the program. The four essential freedoms are essential because those are the freedoms we need in order to have control of the program effectively. The first two freedoms, freedom zero to run the program as you wish, and freedom one to study and change the source code so it does your computing as you wish, those give us individual control. One user has control of what the program does for him. Freedoms two and three are needed for collective control so that any group of users can have a version and have control over what that version does. And this could be a group of two people, it could be a group of everyone in a country. We can make any groups we like in order to cooperate with people to exercise control over the program. But if we don't have the four freedoms, then the users don't control the program. Thus, the program controls the users. And the owner controls the program and through it exercises unjust power over the users. Thus, society has a choice to make. On one hand, we have individual freedom, social solidarity, and democracy. On the other, we have effectively the dictatorship of the owner of the program over the users. Society must reject proprietary software and choose free software. We invite you to escape from proprietary software and join us in the free world that we have built. I started the free software movement in 1983. I wanted to make it possible to use a computer and have freedom. It was impossible because the computer won't do much without an operating system installed. And all the operating systems for modern computers in 1983 were proprietary. So if you bought a new computer, to make it usable, you had to put in an operating system, and that was always proprietary, 
and there went your freedom. So how could I change that? I was one man without much fame and without much money. Few people agreed with me. So I didn't think I would get very far with an ordinary political movement where you protest in the street and send letters to officials. And besides, I had no experience doing that because I was not a political organizer. I was an operating system developer. But as an operating system developer, I had another way to bring about the same change. All I had to do was write an operating system. Then, as the author, I could legally make it free software. And then, everyone would be able to use computers in freedom by running my system. In other words, I had a way to rescue people from the injustice of proprietary software by doing technical work in my own field. It, Sometimes yes, sometimes no, it's not important. It's a, dis it's a distraction. Please, unless you don't understand what I've said, save your questions for the end. If you want me to clarify what I just said, then ask right away. Otherwise, save it for later. <clears throat> so, I had the skills necessary, well, I was aware of the injustice of proprietary software, which most people didn't recognize as an injustice. I had the skills necessary to try to save people from this injustice, and it looked like nobody else was going to try. That meant, so, so it was me or nothing. That meant I had been elected by circumstances to do this work. It was my duty. It's as if you see somebody drowning and you know how to swim and there's no one else around and it's not Bush. <laughs> then you have... Then you have a moral duty to save this person. Well, perhaps that statement is too strong we might identify some other people about whom I should not affirm a moral duty to save them, like Bush's torturers and the people who protect them, like Obama, and some former generals in South American countries, some of whom are now in prison, uh, and maybe others as well. Fortunately, I don't need to resolve all these questions because I don't know how to swim. <laughs> but in the real case in my life, the work to be done was not swimming, it was writing lots of software, and that I knew how to do. So, So I decided to develop an operating system that would be entirely free software. That means every piece would be free software. Not one line of proprietary code in the entire system. Because if any piece is proprietary, that takes away your freedom. We had to get all the way there, not just almost there. Then I decided to recruit other people to help write it, to get it done sooner. Then I decided to make it a Unix-like system to get the technical benefits of Unix and so Unix users would be able to switch easily. Now Unix was a proprietary operating system that was popular at the time. We couldn't use it and have freedom, but it was advantageous to make a system with the same commands. And then I gave it a name which is a joke. Because no matter how serious a project is, why not have some fun along the way? The name of the system is GNU, G-N-U. And that's a recursive acronym. It stands for GNU's Not Unix. 
So the G in GNU stands for GNU. Some non-programmers find this confusing. <laughs> the reason I used a recursive acronym is that was the traditional way in my community to give credit in such a situation. When you're making a program inspired by some other program and similar to it in its interface, you could give your program a name, which is a recursive acronym saying that your program is not the other one. So there was a text editor called Tico, and some, then pe other people wrote versions of Tico, and somebody called his version Tint for Tint is not Tico. That was the first recursive acronym. And then I developed the first Emacs editor, and there were 30 imitations of Emacs, and some were called something Emacs, which is clear but not funny. But there was also fine for fine is not Emacs, and sign for sign is not Emacs, and Ina for Ina is not Emacs, and mince for mince is not complete Emacs. And version two of Aina was called Zwei, for Zwei was Aina initially. <laughs> so, of course, I wanted a recursive acronym, and that's the one I found. But it's, in order for it to be a joke, it has to have another meaning. So why GNU and not FNU or SNU or UNU? Because those are not words. But GNU is a word, you see. That's why it's a joke. GNU is the name of this animal that lives in Africa. So that meant it was an okay name to use because it it had two meaning. It would have two meanings. One meaning is the animal, and the other is the recursive acronym. But it's much better than that because GNU is the most humor-charged word in the English language, used in countless word plays, because according to the dictionary, the G is silent and it's pronounced new. So every time you want to write the word new, you can, instead of writing N-E-W, you can write G-N-U and you've got a joke. Perhaps not a very good joke, <laughs> but there are a lot of them, so they have taught us to associate this word with laughter. So given a specific meaningful reason to use this as the name of a programming project, I couldn't resist. <laughs> but when it's the name of our system, please do not follow the dictionary. Please pronounce a hard G, pronounce it GNU. If you say the new system, you've already made a mistake. You see, we've been developing it for 29 years and using it for 20 years, so it's not new anymore. <laughs> but it still is GNU, and it will always be GNU. There's another erroneous pronunciation you need to avoid. You'll hear lots of people who, when they talk about the GNU system, pronounce it Linux. How did such a gross error get started in the first place? During the 1980s, our work in the GNU project was to develop the hundreds of components needed for a Unix-like operating system. Well, I wrote some of them. I recruited people to write others. In some cases, I persuaded people to free programs so that we could use them. For instance, BSD. You may have heard of the BSD system. Well, BSD existed in 1983. It was a proprietary modified version of Unix. So in 85 or 86, I visited Berkeley and spoke to the developers of BSD. I asked them to please separate their code from AT&T's Unix code so that they could release their code as free software. And a few years later they did, and I was glad because that meant we could use those programs in GNU. 
And in some cases, some other project for totally unrelated purposes released some software that we could use and made it free software. Now, they were not aiming to make a free operating system, but nonetheless, if their program fit in and was useful, we used it. So by 1990, we had almost all of the system, but one major essential component was missing. That was the kernel. The kernel of an operating system is the program that allocates the machine's resources to all the other programs you run. We started developing a kernel in 1990. The Free Software Foundation hired somebody to write it, and I chose the basic design, an advanced, elegant design. That may have been a problem because that gave it to some extent the character of a research project. And thanks to that and to various other practical problems, it took six years to get a test version running. The GNU herd does run, but it would need a lot of work to be competitive with the other kernel we use. So that's too bad. But fortunately, we didn't have to wait, because in 1992, Mr. Torvalds, who had written a proprietary kernel called Linux, decided to free it. So once Linux became free software, effectively it filled the last gap in GNU. So we, of course, expected the GNU herd to be working and really powerful and a big advance in technology soon. So we are not the ones who put Linux together with the components of the GNU system. It was other people. And after a while, when we saw that this was working well and that our kernel still wasn't running, we decided to support this too. But in any case, the people who put Linux together with the big and small components of the GNU system, they focused so much on this one piece that they perceived all the rest as a small add-on. So they essentially equated this whole thing with this one piece, and they started talking about a Linux system, which means giving us no credit for our work. That's not nice. We started the whole thing, we did the biggest part of the, of the code, and the vision for the goal came from this project, so it seems to me we deserve at least equal mention, and that's all we ask for. So when you talk about this system, please call it GNU plus Linux, or GNU slash Linux. Now when you're talking about Torvalds' kernel, you should call it Linux. He wrote that, he gave it its name, we should call it by the name he gave it. But when you're talking about the larger system that we started, please mention the name we gave it. But it's true that the issue of credit is not the most important ethical issue in life. If it were just about credit, it wouldn't be very important. The problem is that this mistake in the name of our system leads to other worse consequences. In fact, there's something much more important at stake in your choice of the name for this system. Your freedom is at stake, indirectly, of course because directly the name doesn't change the thing. If you call roses onions, that won't change the roses, at least not today. But it will get cooks confused because they'll say, go get some onions and Kitty will come back with a bunch of roses. What, well, these are not onions, but the store said they were onions. It was a, the sign said onions. But in the long term, you might even change the roses because the people who grow roses would start cultivating, what's wrong? Something wrong with the camera? No, <laughs> I'm showing the photo. Oh, okay. Uh, so 
the people who grow roses will start breeding varieties of roses that smell and taste like onions for the sake of all those confused cooks. So the words you choose make a difference. They determine the message you convey to others, which influences their thoughts, which then guide their actions. Since 1983, the name GNU has been associated with our ideas of freedom. The name Linux is associated with different ideas, with the ideas of Mr. Torvalds. And what are they? Well, he never agreed with the idea that you deserve freedom as a user of computing. He doesn't believe that he deserves freedom as a user of computing. He says that he's happy to use proprietary software as long as it's convenient and reliable. Well, he's entitled to his views. He's not entitled to promote his views at our expense by citing our work as if it were his. And that's what in fact happens. Because when people call the system Linux, they think that it's what he started in 1991. They think the system comes from his vision and philosophy. They admire him tremendously for our work as well as for his own work. And so they adopt his philosophy without question. After all, his philosophy is more mainstream. It doesn't criticize a mainstream view, so it's easy to accept. And so those people don't learn to demand freedom for themselves which means that the day that we have to fight to defend our freedom, they won't be there because they never thought of it about, they never were in favor of it anyway. And if we are fewer, we might lose. We might all lose. You see, freedom is frequently threatened. To keep it, we have to defend it. Massive government surveillance is spreading in Brazil. I'm told that in Rio de Janeiro, there are cameras that track cars everywhere. But Brazil's not satisfied with that. It has a plan to require radio transmitters in every car so that they can track cars all around the country. Now, you should be fighting against this. Maybe now the fight will start, I hope. But in other areas, the debate about human rights has gone on for decades or centuries. Enough time to reach conclusions about what human rights people are entitled to and spread them around the world. And sometimes this enables us to defend human rights. But computing is a new area of life. It's less than 20 years since the people in a few advanced countries, since the majority of the people in a few advanced countries started using computing. And in other countries, it's much less. So this is not much time to have a debate about what human rights people deserve in using a program. But in fact, the debate never started. Nearly all the users of computing started with proprietary software in an environment of other users of proprietary software, and that's the only possibility they knew of. So they took for granted that proprietary software. I'm just wondering what's making such a loud noise. Oh, really? Strange. Well, if those people want to come in, we could shut the door. It's not a disaster anyway, though. I was more I was more curious than bothered. So. Yeah, I don't think it's on the microphone. That doesn't seem plausible. Ah, now that stopped it. Mostly. 
Anyway, no, leave, the, leave it open because it's good to have some air blowing through. So, you can delete this from the recording. It's not <laughs> worth it. Um, so, in effect, users of computers allowed the proprietary developers to dictate the answer. And the answer they dictated was to the question, what human rights do you deserve in running a program, was effectively none. That they can dictate any terms they like. And most people accepted that, but not us. We in the free software movement want to start a debate about this because we believe we have identified four human rights that the user of a program deserves and those are the four freedoms that define free software. They should never be taken away. But when we try to bring these ideas to the attention of the public or even the users of the GNU system, we encounter two obstacles. First, the users don't know it's the GNU system. They think it's Linux and they think it was developed by Mr. Torvalds. So if they see the articles where we explain our ideas, Actually, I need to open this door because the, uh, the air is not sufficient now. It's getting hot. I'd rather have a little noise than heat. They think the system is Linux and it was developed by Torvalds. So when they see the articles where we explain the philosophy that's the reason for the GNU system, the reason for the system they're using, they say, this comes from those GNU extremists. Why should I read this? I'm a Linux user. I admire the pragmatic philosophy of Mr. Torvalds. I won't read it. How ironic, because really, it's the GNU system with Linux that they are using, but they don't know it. And so they admire the pragmatic philosophy of a person who did one piece of the system. And when they say pragmatic, what it really means is taking important long-term decisions based on short-term convenience, which is not wise at all. But never mind that. So if they knew that, there's, that the system is GNU slash Linux, they might say something different to themselves. They might say, I'm a GNU slash Linux user, and here is the philosophy behind GNU. This is the reason why the system exists. I had better pay attention. And we would have a chance to convince them that they deserve freedom and they should fight for it. And then we might win. And this is why just by calling the system GNU slash Linux, even though it takes a little bit of effort and you'll be conscious that you're going against some other people's current, you will be helping us considerably because you'll be informing a lot of other people where this system really comes from. But nowadays we have another obstacle. Lots of people don't know about free software. They've only heard about, quote, open source, unquote. What is that? Well, during the 90s, as the GNU slash Linux system spread, there were two political camps in the free software community. There was the free software movement, those of us who said, this is essential for our freedom, we should fight for our freedom, and it's wrong to make a program non-free. And then there was the other camp, the people who didn't look at this in ethical terms, people like Torvalds, people who participated in the community, and many of them contributed to the practical work, but without agreeing with our philosophy. So there was a debate between the camps, and people entering the community could see the debate and thus become aware of the existence of the free software movement. But in 1998, people in the other camp coined the term open source as a way to avoid the word free. Now, the word free is ambiguous, it's a drawback, but they didn't aim to more clearly talk about freedom, just the opposite. They aimed to forget the whole idea. Having a new term, 
they were able to choose which ideas to associate with their term and which ideas to leave out. And they chose to leave out the entire ethical level of the issue. So they present an idea based on purely convenience values, nothing deeper than that. Where we say you should insist on freedom, they say if the developer lets you change and redistribute the software, you might find it works better. We say if you release a program, you must respect the user's freedom. It's wrong if you don't. They say if you release a program, it's a good idea to let users change and redistribute the program because they will improve the code quality. You see the difference. It's a totally different philosophy. But those were the majority and most of the businesses in the community were on their side. So soon all you would see in the major media was open source. Free software was in danger of being hidden and forgotten. Before 1998, our software informed people about free software and the ideas and so they had a chance to think about it. At least they knew what we were saying. But nowadays, most people who hear about us hear our work labeled as open source and they think that we agree with that. Those are the only ideas they've ever heard. So every week I get several letters from people saying that they appreciate my contributions to open source. I've never intentionally done anything for open source. I disagree with its basic values. Uh, I've even seen articles, well, and some of these messages take for granted that my ideas are the ideas they've seen associated with open source. And I've even seen articles that called me the father of open source. Cringe. <laughs> what use is anything I do if people associate me with a totally different idea? So I send a letter to the editor saying, if I'm the father of open source, it was conceived through artificial insemination using stolen sperm <laughs> without my knowledge or consent. <laughs> then I explain the ideas of the free software movement. And this, of course, is the payload of the letter. This is the reason why the letter is useful, so that the people reading that periodical get to see what the ideas of free software are. What was missing from the article. But I can't do all this myself. We need you to help. Now, you can help a lot just by, you, you can help a lot by giving speeches. I had to learn to give good speeches. You can learn it too. But that's a lot of work, I must admit. Each speech will take hours. Of course, you could learn to give shorter speeches than they might only take half an hour. It'll do some good. But if you only have a few seconds a day to give to us, well, say GNU slash Linux and say just software livre, don't say Codigo Alberto. Just for, leave that out. And that way you will help spread our ideas. Now, in such a short period of time, you can't explain our ideas, but just by mentioning our names, you can pave the way for our efforts, which we're going to make anyway, to have more effect. Now this is important and this, in fact, since 1998 I have dedicated most of my effort to traveling and giving speeches about free software so that open source won't hide us and make us be forgotten. We have not been forgotten thanks to the efforts of free software activists who work to inform other people about these ideas. But we have to keep doing it because in the long term our future depends above all on what we value. 
If we want to establish lasting freedom, it's not enough just to hand people freedom as a gift. Because if someone has freedom but doesn't appreciate it, he will lose it. It'll slip through his fingers. If he cares about freedom, he'll hold on to it, and then he might keep it. You see, life offers people lots of opportunities to trade their freedom for something attractive. Well, the people who don't appreciate freedom will trade it away. The people who care will hold on to it. So if we want people, so if we magically had free software f for every job, we could distribute this and we could tell people magically the keys to install software in their tyrant computers and tomorrow they could all have freedom. But would they still have freedom in five years? Not necessarily, because if they don't appreciate it, they'll give it up. So if we want to establish a lasting freedom, we have to teach them to teach people in general to demand freedom, to appreciate freedom. Even within the free software community, we have reached freedom and lost it again because a lot of people didn't care enough. For instance, there are over a thousand different distributions of GNU slash Linux, variants of the system, and they compete. And almost all of them have non-free programs in them. And they present these non-free programs as an advantage. They say, our system, our system is more convenient because of these. Don't you like these? There are just a few GNU slash Linux distributions which are entirely free software because they're maintained by people for whom freedom is the goal. <clears throat> if you look at gnu.org slash distros, you'll find a list. They include, for instance, Ututo and GnuSense and Triskel and several more. But these are not the well-known popular distros because those still have non-free software. And perhaps the worst of them is Ubuntu. <laughs> Ubuntu not only contains and suggests non-free software, it also has an intentional spy feature. So you see, with free software, we have a defense against malicious functionalities. Users are studying the code. They, from top, if they see something malicious, they can take it out. And people are taking out, taking out this spy feature from their versions of Ubuntu. Usually this acts as a deterrent. Developers who, of proprietary software are aware that they have power over the users. So they feel, they know that if they put in malicious features, the users can't fix that. That's a lot of temptation, so they do it often. The developers of free software, they realize they don't have power over the users. The users can fix it. And if they see what's wrong, a lot of users will fix it. Well, most of the time, this is such a discouraging thing, prospect, that it's not a temptation anymore. But the developers of Ubuntu apparently think that they're going to get away with this, that enough people will tolerate it, that they'll really be able to get collect information and get some benefit from that. So we have to show them it's not true. We have to show them that this is the path to failure so that they'll take out the spy feature and we can thus once again have a really good record of successfully defending our users. You see, with free software we have a defense, but it's not a perfect defense. A defense against malware, that is. But no perfect defense is known. The point is that with free software, we have a defense, and the users of proprietary software are totally defenseless. They're at the mercy of the developers. But still, it'll be much better for the success of free software if we point to a lot of successful defense 
If there's a big instance where our defense didn't work, that's a big setback for our community. So please join me in pushing against Ubuntu until they get rid of the spyware. But in general, these distros that have non-free software in them, how do they do harm? Well, they do it in two ways. First of all, users, if they hear suggestions to install those distros, they do that and they don't get all the way to freedom because the distros offer them non-free programs and they install those. So they still have non-free software in their machines. It's not as bad as using Windows or Mac OS, but still, it's, they haven't got all the way to freedom. But even worse, people who come into the community often formulate their ideas of the goal based on what other people around them are doing. And if they see that people around them are using Ubuntu or some other non-free distro and promoting those non-free distros, they think, well, that's, this is what it's all for. These distros are the goal, which means that they don't make freedom their goal. If they think of these non-free distros as good, they are forced to conclude that the non-free programs in these distros are also good. And if they're good, they can't be bad. If it's a solution, it can't be the problem. So our goal is to teach people to recognize non-free software as the problem. So it's not a solution. And nowadays, Linux, Torvalds' kernel, is not entirely free software. Most of it's free, but some pieces are not. These are called binary blobs. They consist of long lists of numbers. And each list represents an executable program dressed up as source code. But the real source code of that program is not available, so it's not free. And so what happened here? Torvalds started making Linux as free software. Sorry, he started as proprietary software in 91. And then in 92, he made it free. And then some years later, he started putting in non-free pieces, which most of us didn't become really aware of until yet later. Well, for him, this was never a question of principle. For him, this question is not a question of principle and never was. It was just a practical decision for him. And what this shows is when our freedom depends on somebody who doesn't value freedom, our freedom is precarious because a decision that he makes for convenience could take it away. So because Torvalds' Linux is non-free partly now, we can't use that. We have to make a modified version, which is called Linux Libre. And the work is very easy because we have scripts. The scripts recognize the pieces that are non-free and delete them. So every time Torvalds makes a new version of Linux, we run the script and we get a new version of Linux Libre. Okay, well it's easy and it gives us something ethical, something we can distribute and recommend. However, there's an underlying problem that's harder to solve. Why did Torvalds put those non-free programs into Linux? because it wasn't easy to get free replacements for them. Those are firmware programs. What they do is they get installed into a peripheral. The system has to copy that piece of firmware into a peripheral to make the peripheral work. And the reason that a non-free program is needed is because what job that firmware has to do is a secret. We can't write a free program to do it because we can't find out what it should do. Well, the way you find out is with reverse engineering. And this job is tremendously important. If you want to make a 
technical contribution to the free software community and you want it to be a big contribution, do reverse engineering. Find out the specs of these peripherals. Find out what the firmware has to do and publish that and someone else will write free firmware. You only have to do the first part because that's the really hard part. You can leave the rest to someone else and we will thank you greatly. So as long as this problem exists, there are two ways to confront it. Well, there are two ways to react to it. One is to confront it, acknowledge it, and the other is to paint it over, try to hide it. Torvald's reaction is to hide it, paint it over. He put these non, it's a fact that these peripherals can't be used in the free world. So he put non-free programs into Linux so that it would look like there was no problem. P the users wouldn't realize that they were leaving the free world. Whereas our reaction is to acknowledge the problem, ask people to solve it, and in the meantime, recognize that these peripherals don't work in the free world and we can't tell you a way to use them, an ethical way. So you see, people's values make a difference in what they do. Nowadays, you might be running proprietary programs without even knowing they're in your computer. Many web pages contain software written in JavaScript. It's usually proprietary. and it gets installed into your browser silently and it runs and the browser doesn't tell you it's running non-free software. Unless you install our LibreJS add-on for Firefox. That's a program that analyzes the JavaScript that tries to get into your browser to see if it's either free or trivial. And if so, it can run. But if it's non-trivial and non-free, then LibreJS blocks it and warns you, this page has non-trivial, non-free JavaScript. And it also invites you to send a complaint. And to help you send a complaint, it looks through the site, heuristically looking for ways to complain. How do you reach the webmasters? It's a pain in the neck to look for that yourself but now you don't have to. This program will just show you how to complain. And so now that it's easy to complain, please complain. It's very important to complain. We need to pressure all those webmasters to liberate their JavaScript code. To do that, we need to give them lots of complaints. So please complain every day. And if you'll say, I couldn't use your site because it has non-free JavaScript and it, I won't run that and your site didn't work if I didn't run the JavaScript, they will think that that's important. They want people to use their site. Right now they assume that everyone will run their non-free JavaScript code. We have to show them there are people who won't. But in fact there's another way to lose the control of your own computing nowadays which doesn't involve running a non-free program yourself. It's called Software as a Service, or SaaS. And what it means is that the user, instead of doing her own computing by running a program herself, sends all the pertinent data to somebody else's server, and the computing gets done in that server by programs that the user can't see or touch, and then the server sends back the results or else takes action directly on her behalf. And this way, the user has no control of her own computing. Who has control? Whoever operates the server controls how her computing gets done. So it's the same result as using a non-free program, but it's produced through a different mechanism. It comes to the same thing. The users don't have control of their own computing. <clears throat> 
but it arises differently. So software as a service has the same bad result as running a non-free program, but it's actually even worse. I explained how some non-free programs have spy features which send data about the use of the machine to a server. Well, with SAS, the user has to send all the relevant data to a server. It's the same result. And who knows who that server will show the data to. But it gets even worse. I explained how some proprietary programs have a universal backdoor that allows somebody to remotely install software changes by force and thus that somebody has the power to change how the user's computing is done without asking the user's permission. Well, with SAS, the server operator, of course, can install different software at any time and should be free to do so. It's his computer. But by doing so, he changes how the user's computing is being done without asking the user's permission. So SAS is inherently equivalent to running a non-free program with a spy feature and a universal backdoor. So the only way to protect yourself is don't use SAS. That's why we have these buttons that say, don't SAS me. <laughs> So, fortunately, SAS is rather rare. That is, it's only a very small fraction of websites that are SAS. Because most websites, if, we, if these are all the websites, most of them just publish information. When you look at these sites, you're not doing your own computing. It isn't your own computing. It's looking at their publications. So the issue of SAS doesn't arise. But if we look at the ones that do a non-trivial service, most of these do a, a service of communication with others. Now, communicating with other people is not your own computing. It's a kind of joint computing. So that's not something you could expect to have total control over. So the issue of SAS does not arise. But there are services which invite you to do your own computing or invite a group of people to do the group's own computing or invite an organization to do the organization's own computing in somebody else's server. And those cases are SAS and that's what you shouldn't do. The last point I want to mention is that of free software and education. All educational activities, including all schools from kindergarten through the university, must teach exclusively free software. 100% free software. And this is not just because they might be able to save money. That's a nice secondary benefit, but that's not what's really important. This is not just about how to make education a little better. This is about how to do good education instead of bad education. You see, the school has a social mission, which is to educate good citizens of a strong, capable, independent, cooperating, and free society. In the computing field, that means graduating skilled users of free software, people who are ready to take their place in a free society. But teaching a proprietary program is implanting dependence on a particular entity. That is wrong. That goes against the social mission of the school, so never. Why do some proprietary software developers offer gratis copies of their non-free programs to schools? They're trying to use those schools as instruments to implant dependence in society. So the school teaches the students to use this program, they become dependent, and then they graduate. And after that, 
the same developer does not offer them gratis copies. Oh, no. And some of them go to work for companies. The developer does not offer those companies gratis copies. Oh, no. So the idea is that the school directs its students down the path of dependence and they pull the rest of society with them. It's just like what drug traffickers do when they offer gratis needles full of addictive drugs saying the first dose is gratis. The school would reject the drugs even if they're gratis and it should reject the proprietary software even if it's gratis for the sake of its social mission. But there is an even deeper reason for the sake of the education of the good programmers. Some people have a natural talent for programming. At the age of 10 to 13, they typically, they become fascinated with programming and if they use a program, they want to know, how does it do this? Well, if that program is proprietary, the teacher can only say, I'm sorry, it's a secret we can't find out. You see, every program embodies knowledge. If it is proprietary, then that knowledge is withheld from the students. And therefore, a therefore, education is not allowed. A proprietary program is the enemy of the spirit of education. Schools must demonstrate their loyalty to the spirit of education, which means they must not tolerate the presence of a proprietary program. That proprietary program offends the spirit that the school is supposed to stand for. <clears throat> so how do you learn to write good, clear code? Why is this important for the education of a programmer? Because programmers start out knowing how to write code, but they don't know what makes that code good or bad. The way you learn what's bad code is you read programs and whatever you have trouble understanding, that's bad code. So if the program is free, the teacher can say, well, this is, this is what I know, and here's the copy of the source code so you can read it. And if there's any point that you can't understand by yourself, show it to me and we'll figure it out together. And that's where our student learns that code was not written very well. You shouldn't write it this way. The way you learn to write good, clear code is by reading lots of code and writing lots of code. Only free software offers the chance to read the code of large programs we really use. But then you have to write lots of code, which means writing code in large programs. Well, to do that, you have to start small. But starting small at writing large programs does not mean writing small programs. That's not even a start. The difficulties, of the challenges of a code for large programs don't even appear in small programs. The way you start small is by writing small changes in an existing large program. And then once you get good at that, you can write bigger changes and bigger until eventually you can write major pieces of a big program. So only free software offers people the chance to write changes in large programs we really use. Any school can offer students the opportunity to perfect their skill at programming, but it has to be a free software school. However, there's an even deeper reason for moral education, education in citizenship. Schools must do more than teach facts and skills. They must teach the spirit of goodwill, the habit of helping others. Therefore, every class must have this rule. Students, if you bring software to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share copies with the rest of the class, including the source code in case someone here wants to learn, because this class is a place where we share our knowledge. Therefore, bringing proprietary software to class is not permitted. To set a good example, the school must follow its own rule. It must bring only free software to class and must share copies with everyone in the class. 
If you have a relationship with a school, it's your response, if you are, say, a student or a teacher or an employee or a parent, it's your responsibility to campaign for that school to move to free software. To do this, you usually need to bring up the issue publicly. It's okay to ask in private, why not? They might say yes, but if they say no, now it's time to talk about it publicly to make other people aware of the issue and f gain more allies and strengthen your movement because you're going to have to pressure them into changing. And if you're a student and the school does something to promote proprietary software, why not have a protest rally? If there's a store where they sell Windows licenses, why not picket that store every day and hand out leaflets explaining that Windows is, is unethical software, it's the enemy of the spirit of education, and a school shouldn't be promoting such a thing. This is the way we overcome social inertia. We do it by pushing. So for more information about free software, look at GNU.org. There is also FSF.org, the site of the Free Software Foundation, where you can find resources and you can also join. You could also join right here if you want to pay your annual dues with cash. There's also FSFLA.org, Free Software Foundation Latin America, which also needs your help. So now it's time for me to present my other identity. I am Saint Ignatius of the Church of Emacs. I bless your computer, my child. Emacs started out as an extensible text editor that I had written that developed into a way of life for many users because it was extended so much they could do all their computing inside Emacs. And then it became a church with the launch of the news group alt.religion.emacs. <laughs> In the Church of Emacs today, we have no services, only software. <laughs> we have a great schism between several rival versions of Emacs, and we also have saints, but fortunately no gods. Instead of gods, we adore the one true editor, Emacs. To be a member of the Church of Emacs, you must recite the confession of the faith. You must say, there is no system but GNU and Linux is one of its kernels. <laughs> then if you become a real expert, you can celebrate that with our ceremony, the Fubar Mitzvah, <laughs> in which you chant part of our sacred scriptures namely the system source code. We also have the cult of the Virgin of Emacs, which refers to anyone who has never used Emacs. And according to the Church of Emacs, offering the Virgin the opportunity to lose Emacs virginity is a blessed act. We also have the Emacs pilgrimage which consists of invoking all the commands of Emacs in alphabetical order. <laughs> there is a Tibetan sect 
that believes it's acceptable to do this automatically with a script, but the mainstream church believes that to gain spiritual merit from this pilgrimage, you need to type the commands by hand. <laughs> the Church of Emacs has certain advantages compared with other churches I won't mention. For instance, to be a saint in the Church of Emacs does not require celibacy, <laughs> but it does require living a life of moral purity. You must exorcise whatever evil propri proprietary operating systems have possessed computers under your control or set up for your regular use and then install a wholly free operating system <laughs> and then only use and install free software with and on the system. If you make this vow and you live by it, then you too will be a saint and you'll have the right to wear a halo if you can find one because they don't make them anymore. <laughs> People sometimes ask whether it's, a, according to the Church of Emacs, it's a sin to use the other editor, VI. <laughs> it's true that VI, VI, VI is the editor of the beast. But using a free implementation of VI is not a sin, it's a penance. <laughs> and my halo is not, as some have said, an old computer disk. This is no computer disk, this is my halo. But it was a computer disk in a previous existence. So thank you. Now it's time for the auction. This is an adorable GNU that needs a home. So I'm going to auction it to you for the benefit of the Free Software Foundation. If you buy the GNU, I can sign the card for you. If you have a penguin at home, you need to get a GNU for your penguin. <laughs> because as we all know, a penguin can hardly function without a GNU. <laughs> we can accept payment either in cash or with a credit card if the card can be used for international payments by phone. And when you bid, please wave your arm and shout the amount that you're bidding. I have to start with its usual price, which is 55 reais. Do I get 55 or more? How much? How much? 55. Okay, I'm hard of hearing, so you need to shout. I've got 55. Do I get 60? I've got 60. Do I get 60? I've got 65. Do I get 70? I've got 70, do I get 75? I've got 80, do I get 85? How much? I've got 85, do I get 90? How much? What is he saying? I've got 90, do I get 95? How much? I've got 95, do I get 100? How much? I've got 100, do I get 110? I've got 100, do I get 110? How much are you bidding? I've got 110. Do I get 120? I've got 120. How much? I want to go up by 10 now so we don't take too long. I've, I've got 120. Do I get 130? I've got 130. Do I get 140? She overbid herself. <laughs> but the funny thing is, this happens often at these auctions. I've got 130, do I get 140? I've got 130, do I get 140? I only have one. 
I've got 130. You can order one from the Free Software Foundation. I've got 130. Do I get 140? I've got 130. Do I get 140? 140 highs for this adorable GNU. <laughs> Do I get 140 highs to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom? Are you bidding? I've got one. Were you bidding 140? I've I've got 140 from her, and she was raising her hand first. So I I've got 140. Do I get 150? What? I've got 150. Do I get 160? I've got 150. Do I get 160? No, I'm not going up by five now, only by tens. I've got 150. Do I get 160? What? I've got 160. Do I get 170? I've got 160. Do I get 170? Do I get 170 for this adorable canoe that needs a home? Do I get 170 to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom? Do I get 170? Last chance to bid 170 or more. I've got 160. Do I get 170 or more? Last chance. Going. Going. Gone for 160. Please come up and pay. If you're going to use a card, the way to do it is to write all the data on paper. Okay. What did you say? Okay. Okay, so I have a, a paper card you can write it on. And so basically come back with both of them. Sure. So now it's time for questions. When I'm hard of hearing. By the way, oh, if you're leaving, please come and take stickers if you wish. Uh, you can take stickers before you leave. And you can also buy stuff if you want. There are plenty of stickers, so for now, just the people who are leaving should take stickers if they want any. These are stickers. Actually, we still need people to take the rubber bands off of them. If you'd like to take the rubber bands off, these stickers are gratis. You can take as many as you want, as many as you can make a good use of. Well, then you're not leaving, so you don't need to take them right now. Uh, there will be yeah. no room for questions. Well, yes, uh, if you are not leaving now, please take stickers later because we're gonna, we have lots of stickers. There are even more, so they're not going to run out. So if you want, if you're this not leaving like now, <laughs> please stay seated. It is for chat? Yes, the button so is... Then you, are yeah. going, you can sell them uh, for us. Yeah. This will only take a, a couple of minutes. So join in our activism. Yes, um, I'm starting to write in some code in Mexico. That's good. Well, by the moment, by the moment, uh, we only have. But you should also join in political activism to pressure the university to move. In other words, writing free software is a good contribution. 
but local organizing to pressure this university to stop teaching proprietary software is also necessary. That's political action. And if you're not a programmer, do political action. Happy hacking. Thank you. Is the woman who was next to you related to you? No, uh, no, I, I met her here. Oh. She's very nice. She's very nice. Uh, I, uh, do you know the laboratory? Uh, Pessoal, uh, vamos sentar, por favor. Por gentileza, a gente está pedindo para o pessoal sentar. Eu quero perguntar algumas perguntas. Eu não sei. Eu estou pronto para responder perguntas agora. Eu posso perguntar uma das perguntas de Metallica? Sim, mas não agora. Eu vou vender todas essas coisas, mas... Você tem que ir agora? Ok, eu quero responder perguntas agora. Pessoal, eu vou traduzir as perguntas para ele aqui. Então, quem quiser fazer as perguntas para ele, eu vou traduzir as perguntas para ele aqui. Então, quem quiser fazer as perguntas, quem sabe inglês, pode fazer a pergunta direto em inglês. Tá, quem não, 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 não consegue, daí eu traduzo. What did he say? Ah, the other thing is people should come over here to ask questions. Don't try to give them the microphone. Then tell her in Portuguese. Pergunta para ele o que que ele tem de se ele tem algum projeto de de GNU para para celular. He's asking uh, for GNU projects for mobiles. If uh, there is any kind of project in the way for mobile Well, there cell are phones. there are some mobile some portable phones that ran GNU slash Linux. It was not entirely free, however, so it wasn't totally ethical. But uh, but they existed. The problem right now is there is no such device that we can run a totally free system on. So we need to do something to get those devices to exist. And I'm looking at ways to try to do it, but uh, it's not going to be easy. And there's no obvious easy path, but we'll just keep trying. I have a question, Mr. Stallman. Mm -hmm. um, about uh, uh, free hardware, is there any project it's about not an It's not a meaningful issue. No? You Why? see, free software concerns the freedom to change and copy and redistribute programs. If we could change and copy and redistribute chips, then we would have a reason to insist on free chips. But we can't change or copy a chip. There's no way to do it, not feasibly. So the issue is not a real issue. Not even if it helps to build uh, uh, Thank you. machines that has uh, 
firmwares that well, are Well, that's different. Yes, that's different. Yeah. Basi you're, that's a different issue. I don't call that free hardware. Free hardware in this context would mean you take the, four, the same four freedoms and apply them to hardware. But that's not a useful thing to do. That's not something that there's any real reason in practice why we should demand, because we, we couldn't exercise those freedoms. Well, we could exercise freedoms zero and one, but generally hardware gives us those freedoms anyway. And as for freedoms two and three, it's impossible. Now, with future technology, it might be different. Now, something that's related to this is 3D printers. 3D printers don't copy things, but they allow you to take a design and make an object. Well, if the object is for practical use, the 3D printer design has to be free. But you notice that you can copy and change these 3D printer designs. You can't copy and change a chip. Você citou pessoas que não acreditam na filosofia do software livre, como o Linus. Você citou várias, várias vezes o Linus. Mas quem você citaria como pessoas que defendem o software livre e que você vê como pessoas que continuarão o projeto GNU? Make it brief, because it has to be translated. You mentioned people that uh, uh, are not uh, uh, in the philosophy of free software and they want to know people that are uh, in the free well, software. Well, let's see, there's Eben Moglen, uh, see, f there, I can't. there is people who are developers of Samba. Uh, I don't have, I can't think of other names to suggest right now. No, there are, there are, there are oh right, Andrew Tridgell is one of them. Uh, I'm not sure who else to suggest that you might have heard of. There are, I know that there are thousands of other people who agree with the philosophy because the Free Software Foundation has almost 3,000 members and th that's only the people who want to pay the dues. So I know there are more, but I don't have names to suggest. You, you wouldn't have heard of them. Come up to the microphone, please. And those of you who have more questions, come up now. Make a line. Make a queue. Uh, thank you for your, your conversation. Uh, I, we, my name is Laura. I'm a professor here in this university. Uh, we are members uh, of free software community. Uh, and I, we work also with uh, computer science for education, free education, uh, public in Brazil education, uh, public education in Brazil that is different in that public education in, in United States. I, uh, we are now developing a, a software that will. Uh, help deaf children hmm. to learn uh, sign language and also uh -huh. written Portuguese. That sounds very useful, especially if it can be adapted to other languages as well. Yeah, it can. Can it be? It can oh, that can. would be great. Would you like Thank to make you. this a GNU <laughs> package? <laughs> if you would like to make this a GNU package, please it's write hard, to me. Hard to, hard to. <laughs> I want. I'm well, write to me. <laughs> Send me an email. But I'm, I'm, I'm frightened now <laughs> with the responsibility. I don't bite. Uh, <laughs> 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 That's magnificent, but uh, uh, let's, let's talk afterwards. Uh, my question was um, just <laughs> uh, what could I do? in order to free the software you will develop, but not allow people of um, uh, private organizations to uh, take advantage of it, to charge the software you can't, themselves. Well, wait, charge, 
You can't. That's impossible. And the reason is, if you stopped people from doing that, it would not be free software. Okay, but, but what the can thing I is, do? the thing is, so if you can't. It's my dilemma. Dilemma. But it's not there. It's not why. What are you afraid will happen anyway? That they will charge uh, for the charge product. Charge who? In what charge. scenario? Who would they be charging, and what activity? The population we want to help. To well, you can't stop them. Inclusion. You can't stop them. Anyway. You can't stop them, <laughs> and it, it's wrong to stop them. The fact is, people using have a right to use free software in commercial activities. People have a deserve the right to use free so, to use okay. software in commercial activities. Okay. And if you stop them, it's not free. That okay. then they don't have freedom zero. Okay. Uh, but in fact. You can be sure that just the workings of the market will make it unlikely that they are charging much money to a lot of people, because there will be other places to get this software, and poor people won't get it from them. People will po poor people won't get it from the businesses. Poor people will get it in some other way. So, uh, work with an organization for the deaf that will make sure all the all the deaf people get it. And there just won't be any market for a business, a yeah, market of this it. kind for a business to exploit. But uh, for profit educational academies will put this stuff on their computers, and, but people won't be paying for this program in particular. They'll be paying to go to those schools. Okay. I got it. Thank you. Hello. Do you think that we can extend the GNU concept to the other knowledge of uh, areas of knowledge? Well, software isn't an area of knowledge, really. It's, you see, knowledge is the wrong is the wrong term to use. The software is an example of a kind of work that is used for doing practical jobs. And I think this whole philosophy ex extends to other works that you use to, that are made for doing practical jobs, such as, for instance, recipes, reference works that you use to look things up, educational works that are used to learn something or teach something, patterns for useful objects to be made with a 3D printer, uh, text fonts, any kind of work that is that can be copied and changed and whose main purpose is to be used for doing practical jobs should be free. And do you think that it, is there a limit for this open knowledge? Like I don't uh, call it open. Uh, this is not knowledge. It's a mistake to call it knowledge. Knowledge in the abstract is different from works. Right? A program embodies knowledge, but it isn't knowledge. A program is different from the knowledge it embodies. Likewise, other works of practical use embody knowledge also, but the works are different from the knowledge. Knowledge is a, is a different issue that we have to treat separately because the, the, the problems and questions are different. So it's a conceptual confusion to equate works with knowledge. They're related, but they're not the same. Okay. For instance, algebra is not the same as an algebra textbook. <laughs> algebra is knowledge. An algebra textbook is a work. But we can have a formula of a medicine and turn it uh, open source. I'm not, I'm not in favor of open source. Those are that's the slogan of people <laughs> who disagree. Free no, software. a medicine is not software. Free medicine. No, something like that's that. A, no, no, that's I mean, meaningless. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. <laughs> totally absurd. Do you want? Anybody and everybody making medicine in uninspected factories, would you trust that? It could kill you. 
The thing is, we don't have a way to copy medicine. The only copier for medicine is Robbie the Robot, and that's in a science fiction movie. So the, these four freedoms have nothing to do with medicine. The fact is that the, the formula and structure of every medicine that's approved is published. See, that secrecy is not what stops other companies from making medicine. What stops other companies from making medicine is patents together with medical test data exclusivity, which is another artificial kind of monopoly that, these, that the big pharma companies have convinced corrupt governments to approve. So, uh, if you want, if you, for instance, if you want a campaign for generic drugs, I'm in favor, uh, especially in countries with a lot of poor people. Uh, but uh, that's a different issue. It's a totally different issue. It's not about whether you, as a user of medicine, are free to copy it. You don't have a copier for medicine. You can't do that. It doesn't matter whether it's legal or not. There's no way to do it. And it's also not about changing medicine. Uh, well, you can try changing a medicine, but that would be making a different medicine. You better do experiments to see what its effects are. But it, enterprise could exchange it. Could what? Exchange. I don't know what you mean by exchange. Exchange what for what? Unfortunately, that's not quite correct English, and I can't guess what meaning you have. Uh. But I think I've said enough about this. It's a totally unrelated <laughs> issue. It's, it's, misle it's mistaken thinking that is trying to identify these totally different issues. The issue of generic medicine is tremendously important because it's life or death for lots of poor people but it's a totally different issue. It's a mistake to try to take all the issues in life and assume that they're the same in their structure. They're not. Alguma pergunta mais? Nós podemos ter liberdade na computação em nuvem? Ah. Cla the term cloud computing is misleading and confusing because it's nebulous. <laughs> it means so many different ways of using the network that it has no real meaning at all. So it can't be used in clear statements. Every statement formulated that way becomes cloudy. And therefore, if you want to think about these various ways of using the network, well, don't use the term cloud computing. If you ask me about some more specific scenario, then I might be able to have an answer. Did someone close windows out there? Is that why there's no wind anymore? Because it's unpleasantly hot without air circulation. Thank you. Brigado. <laughs> Sabe o que faz um brigadeiro? Ele agradece. <laughs> Eu sou o trocagenio. Uh, so the point is, software as a service is one scenario, which is a part of that nebulous idea of cloud computing, but software as a service is specific enough that I can actually say something about it, which is it's bad. But there are other things that some people also call cloud computing, which might be okay. The point is they're different. If you have a more specific question to formulate, come back, come back and... And he already oh, asked, uh, asked it about when you said that there is uh, some, some uh, 
areas on cloud computing that there is freedom? Here no, I wouldn't way? call it cloud computing. The point is, I won't use the term cloud computing to refer to anything because that term is too vague and it misleads people. But if there's, a, if there's some specific case you want to talk about ask, or ask me about, you can do that. He wants to know in what situation uh, there is freedom in something that you... Well, if we're talking about mm -hmm. using the network... Using the network, that is... Well, Basically, there are two questions. One is, are you entrusting your data to somebody you shouldn't trust? Data that you don't want to publish, of course, because you also want to publish some things, and then, of course, everybody can see them. And the other question is, do you maintain control of your own computing? So those are the two issues you can use to evaluate some scenario of using the network. And the point is you shouldn't start using some network service without thinking about these issues. So I'm going Come up if you have a question to ask. Well, you can try. You speak rather loud, but if they need you to use the mic, do you need people to use the microphone for the sake of the recording? Okay, then try shouting. I started the GNU project first. I started developing the GNU system first. And when I had pieces of software that were useful to release, that is, when I had GNU Emacs, because the first things I wrote there was no particular reason to release them. They were just free replacements for parts of Unix. But GNU Emacs did something different, so I figured people wanted to use it on top of Unix. So I decided to release it, and that meant I had to work out how to release it. When I alugo a servidor and use it pela rede, Eu posso garantir que eu estou tendo a liberdade do uso dele, mesmo ele me dando a senha do administrador do servidor? He wants to you can stay around if you need to clear it up, but just let her translate. He wants to know if he, you, you rent um, a server and uh, no. they gave you... No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, the Free okay. Software Foundation has its own no, servers. No, 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 no. If you, somebody, if, I, if he, I, I okay. if he rents a server, yeah, then, sorry, then, sorry. then I, I, the, the, if the company gives me the, the password, the login. And if I you control the software on that server, then that's basically like having a server you own. Doors and could be a, a conceivable, server. It, yes, it's conceivably so. So a virtual server allows you to control your computing, but a server that's hosted in somebody else's building uh, can't give you the the security against intrusion because that company might intrude into it. And you know that if if you rent if you rent a physical server from so and so, uh, and then they might conceivably go go inside it and mess with it, even if they have never done so yet, they might conceivably. Now the Free Software Foundation owns some servers, but we have them co-located in a network facility. So yeah, I guess they could do something and mess with our servers if they wanted to, but as long as they don't do that, we do control our computing. Uh, but as I've said, I don't think I understood that actually more or less. But ah, 
when they, those people who are saying open source hardware, they mean free hardware. Free hardware. Well, actually, or free hardware designs. Well, as I said, we don't need to insist on free hardware designs because we can't really make the hardware, you can't copy it anyway. But it's good to make free hardware designs and someday we might be able to, we might have personal fabricators. Okay, an FPGA is a very simple case. There is a piece of hardware, which is hardware, and into that is loaded a gate pattern, which is software. Well, you, it's hard to do that. And the reason is that the companies that we have to pressure don't deal with the public. They sell a chip to some other company that make, puts it into a computer, which sells it to some other company, which puts its name on this, and then sells it to the public. And if we try to put pressure on this company that puts its name on, they say, there's nothing we can do. We can't even get the specs of that, piece, of, of that chip. It's a secret from us, too. So all we can do is try to get a project, is either reverse engineering or try to get a project developed that will make a machine that isn't a problem. And we're looking at that. Or try to find some company that uh, one way or another makes something that we can use. Come up if you have a question. Don't wait over there. Make a line now. Everybody who has a question to ask, please come up now and get on a line. I would like to know your opinion about the BSD systems and whether or not they're... Well, the BSD systems are... A BSD, the BSD system, because there are a few distros, but fundamentally it's the same system. And they, that's one other free Unix-like operating system that was developed basically independently of GNU. Now, the prop, they, their distros have the same problem as GNU slash Linux distros, namely they have non-free software in them. But there is, there is no, in particular the kernel has firmware that is not free. And there is no entirely free BSD distro. Aside from that, some of the people who work on those BSD distros hate the GNU project because of our practice of using copyleft. They think that people must be free to enslave themselves, <laughs> which I think is just distorting the idea of freedom. Thank you. You can take stickers, sure. Whatever stickers you like, but these are for sale. Come up if you want to ask. Eu sendo pouquinho. Okay, the translation. He's inviting you to go to a university tomorrow in the morning. No, I, I can't do another speech. I'm sorry. Maybe next time I come to Brazil, which will be in June, uh, I could consider that invitation. Contact Alexandre Oliva. No, I wrote it in Tico. So are there any more questions? It looks like there are not, which is fine with me because 
now I'm going to sell these things. Hey. Or would you like to sell them? Would you like to sell them? Okay. Yes.